um, this session is going to be about Kentucky Family Math Free Educator Training, um, and we are excited for you to join us today. Um, our facilitators for the session um, are myself. I'm Erin Chavez. I'm an academic program consultant with the Kentucky Department of Education. And I'm Maggie Doyle. Um, alongside Erin, I'm also an academic program consultant at the Kentucky Department of Education. And I'm Carrie Friedman. I am deputy director and a researcher with the Regional Educational Laboratory for Appalachia at SRI International. And so our sponsors for the Kentucky Family Math Night Initiative, um, Kentucky Center for Mathematics, um, Rail Appalachia, which, um, which Carrie works for, and then um, the Pritchard Committee with their Kentucky Collaborative for Families and Schools Initiative. So our goals for this session are so that you will be able to expand your understanding of research on the importance of mathematics for future success in family and community engagement, um, to help learn new strategies, um, to help support families um, when they're learning mathematics and working with their um, families at home. And then also it's for um, you all to develop a plan for how to lead and implement a community family math night. And then also to consider how the Kentucky Family Math Night could be uh, delivered virtually. And so our plan for today, um, we're gonna review resources available. Um, we're going to look at the facilitator's guide, the growth mindset and family attitudes, the Kentucky standards family guides, math stations, which include games and activities, training considerations, action planning, and then we'll wrap it up. So let's look at some of the resources available. So one of the really nice things that um, will be provided for you is a facilitator's guide. And the facilitator's guide includes background information, activities um, with their instructions, facilitator's notes, materials and handouts, and the, um, for the community family math night. And so it also includes um, what your math night would look like at a glance, um, the family, the standards family guides, um, the background for the facilitator's notes, table handouts, parent handouts, table materials. So all included in that facilitator's guide. And so when you're um, thinking about implementing your family math night, you might just want to look at a schedule. And so this math at a glance document kind of tells you the flow of that evening or of that day um, and the time frames. Um, and then you might need to think about how you would want to do this virtually. You know, maybe it's that you want to share with your parents and your families the um, math attitudes and growth mindset um, at one point in time during the day if you're doing it virtually. And then maybe the next day you want to talk about the standards family guides. And then maybe the following day you want to do um, one activity from each domain. That's kind of up to you, um, and we know that you all will have great ideas as you're implementing these nights or days. So here's just a couple examples of what the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, of what some of the activities look like. Um, there are the grade baited activities. There's K1, 2, 3, and 4, 5 um, for each domain. So um, this is just kind of what it looks like. It talks about um, the facilitator's notes, how they are aligned to the um, content standards for the Kentucky Academic Standards for Mathematics and the practice standards. Um, it also tells you the purpose of the game and then what materials you would need. All right, well, let's now talk about why we're focusing on engaging families in math. So in the past, math was often taught as a set of rules to follow, but that's not exactly what mathematics is or how it's taught today. Math is about puzzling over problems, trying multiple strategies, and finding solutions. And we know that early math skills are essential to a child's learning and success in school, and they predict later math performance in math um, as well as other subjects. So math achievement is really important for students in Kentucky, and not just for future school success, but for employment in a growing sectors of our workforce. 
So family math nights are intended to engage the broader community, such as family members, community leaders, um, in understanding the importance of math and learning how to best support their child in learning math. From the research, we know that children who believe they can be successful in math will put in more effort, which leads to better math performance. And students who perform better in math in elementary school are more likely to succeed in middle and high school. And success in middle and high school leads to higher incomes and opportunity in a growing number of STEM and non-STEM jobs. We also know that families are natural role models and they can support their children in developing math skills by doing things like praising effort, modeling positive math attitudes, and encouraging children to seek help and try new strategies, as well as confronting stereotypes about who is good at math. So we want families to understand the importance of math and feel comfortable and confident in supporting their children to learn. One way families can support children's math learning is by promoting positive math attitudes and adopting a growth mindset. So when students are learning math, how adults talk about the subject really matters. And research has found that adults' reactions to a student's work will impact the student's achievement and their own attitudes about the subject. So for example, if a child is learning something new in math and asks a parent for help, some parents may feel uncomfortable helping the child. They might say something like, well, I'm not very good at math. I'm not really a math person. And while they may feel this way, it's important for them to think about what this communicates to their child. If the parent doesn't react positively, we can't really expect the child to. So in addition to paying attention to how we react when a child asks us for help with their work, we want to pay attention to how we communicate expectations for them. If they're struggling with math, you might try to comfort them by saying something like, oh, it's okay, not everyone's a math person. But we have to think about how this communicates low expectations. Um, and we, we, it communicates that they don't need to try harder. So let's look at um, two different mindsets that we can use when we're engaging with children in math. The first is a fixed mindset. It's the belief that people are born with intelligence they have. There's not much they can do to change it. The other is a growth mindset. This is the belief that people can increase their intelligence through hard work and persistence. So you can use your brain like you use your muscles. With a growth mindset, um, you might say things like, you completed that problem. How did you do it? Did you use a new problem solving method? Um, or I'm so proud of the effort you put in. As opposed to a fixed mindset, where you might say something like, you're good at so many other things, but maybe math just isn't your subject. So the main message here is that we want to praise children's effort, not just their intelligence. So now that you have an understanding of the importance of math attitudes and growth mindset, I'm going to share the opening presentation for our Kentucky Family Math Nights. And as you listen and engage with the presentation, try to wear two hats. First, as a learner, think about yourself as a student or family member hearing this presentation. And consider how will family members react or engage with this information? Or is there anything that will be confusing or unclear for families? And then, as a facilitator, of the math night, consider what modifications you might need to make to the content, any logistical considerations for presenting, and who at your school would be really good at leading this presentation. So the content of the presentation is based on the ideas we just discussed, building awareness about math attitudes and growth mindsets, and how families can shift their attitudes and mindsets. So the first thing you'll want to do is a little icebreaker. We'll ask families to think about which book they identify with as a math learner. And this might start to reveal some of their initial math attitudes and ideas about math learning. So do they feel like math is um, similar to Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day? The little engine that could? No one follow the rules or oh, the things you could think. Then we'll get started on the presentation. So you'll let families know that there are math activities to come. But first, we think it's important to talk about how adults' attitudes towards math can influence children's math learning. When students are learning math, how adults talk to them about the subject really matters. Research studies have found that adults' reactions to a student's work will impact the student's achievement and attitudes towards the subject. For example, if a child is learning something new in math and asks the parent for help, some parents may re react by saying they're not very good at math or they don't know how to do this new math. While they may feel this way, it's important for them not to communicate 
um, poor math attitudes to their child. If the parent doesn't react positively, we can't expect the child to. In addition to how we react, we need to pay attention to how we communicate our expectations. So when a child is struggling, you might try to comfort them by saying something like, plenty of people have trouble in math, but go on to be successful in other fields. And while this may be comforting, it communicates that you have low expectations for them in math, so they might not try harder. Instead, you can use phrases like, I know this is hard, but maybe you can try another way to solve the problem. Or, I know this is hard, but you're learning something new, and sometimes this takes a lot of work. When we're engaging with children in math, it's important to reflect on how we're approaching the subjects, the subject and the attitudes we hold. And there are two ways we can categorize these attitudes. One is a fixed mindset, which is the belief that people are born with the intelligence they have, and there's not much they can do to change it. The other is a growth mindset, the belief that people can increase their intelligence through hard work and persistence, that you can work your brain like you work your muscles. Often, adults talk about the ability to learn math as something that's fixed with a child, possibly using phrases like, you completed the problem because you're really smart, or you're good at so many other things, maybe math just isn't your subject. However, these phrases are not the best way to encourage young children. They are promoting a fixed mindset. So you'll want to switch to phrases like, you completed the problem so fast, I bet you worked really hard at it. Or, I know you're struggling with math, maybe you need to find a new strategy. These are the types of phrases that promote growth mindset. So looking at these two phrases here, the first, not everyone is a math person, you're so good at other subjects. That's our fixed mindset. The second, well done, you've worked really hard on the problem. That's our growth mindset. Let's try another one. For the first one, you got a higher grade on this assignment, you must have worked really hard. The second, you got a higher grade on this assignment, you must be really smart. Which of these promotes growth mindset? It's the first one. Now, just to drive home the point, I would like to tell you a story about the difference in how children may react to adults' attitudes towards learning math. Lisa is a third grade teacher. She just administered a test on measurement in her classroom. Two of her students, Josh and Madison, received the exact same grade, a C. So Lisa asked them how they plan on improving their scores for the next test. And Josh says, oh my goodness, I got a bad grade on this test. I'm just not good at math. I don't think I will ever like it. I'm not sure what I can do to get better. Luckily, I'm good at English and science. Madison responded in another way. She said, I wasn't expecting this grade. I studied really hard, but not the night before the test. I guess for the next test, I'll study harder and maybe study the day before the test. Maybe my friend Martha can help me. She got a really good grade on this test. So both students received the same grade, but reacted very differently. Lisa recognized that Madison had a growth mindset for mathematics. She encouraged Madison to talk to Martha for help and provided her with additional study strategies. But what can she do for Josh, who displays a fixed mindset? Well, she can do the exact same thing. First, she can encourage Josh to have a positive attitude toward learning math. She can also remind him that she has the same high expectations for all her students, and he is no exception. Then she can give him some study strategies to help him feel better about the math content. Lastly, she can help Josh find a study partner who may, may be able to share different ways to tackle the problems. So today, the message we want you to take home is that adults' attitudes towards math can influence a child's math achievement. The feedback we give children is important for their learning, and changing your mindset and your feedback can help your children succeed at math. Remember to praise effort and learning. So with your learner hat, we want you to think about how will family members engage or react to this information? And is there anything you think will be confusing or unclear for families in your community. In your facilitator hat, you might want to consider logistical considerations, such as how will you present this? Will it be on a virtual platform? How will you be able to engage with participants? And do you have anyone in mind at your school who could lead this in a really engaging way? So one of the resources that's also included in the Kentucky Family Math Night materials is the Standards Family Guides. 
And so we are really excited to share with you about this resource and we hope that you will share it far, share it wide um, as much as you can. So the standards family guides are located on kystandards.com, which you can see pictured on the screen. And each guide contains an overview for reading and writing, mathematics, science, and social studies. And those guides are available by grade level, and then there's a separate one for high school. So um, I'd also just like to point out that those guides are also now available in Spanish. So as you think of ways, whether in person or whether virtually, to support the families and the parents and the caregivers in your community, you know, we'd love for you to utilize these resources. So let's talk about what's inside. So each family guide contains for each content area um, some guiding questions. So why are the Kentucky academic standards important and how are they organized to support parents as they're trying to um, work with children outside of the classroom setting? There are also really um, important resources such as examples of your child's work at school, how to help your child at home, which is a great resource to have, questions you can ask your child, and for families, questions that they can ask you because um, for them, you are the content expert. And so giving them the tools to talk to you and to know what to ask to support their children is really important. So there's some really powerful content in here. If you are able to host an in-person Kentucky Family Math Night, give these out. Um, but if you can't, share these virtually because they can be really powerful tools in helping um, our children be successful as they're working on content um, either in the classroom or somewhere else. All right, so you've gotten powerful information about growth mindset um, and math attitudes. And then Maggie just shared a great resource, um, our Kentucky Family Standards Guides on kystandards.org. So the next part of the, your Kentucky Family Math Night, whether it be face-to-face -face or whether it be virtually, um, is where the families actually engage in the mathematics. And so um, you might set up math stations um, and maybe it is in the cafeteria, maybe it's in the gym, maybe it's in your library, um, where, or maybe it's in different stations in a classroom. And we've seen that um, when we've um, had the chance and the opportunity to visit Kentucky Family Math Nights. Or maybe you give one of these um, stations or activities virtually and do a recording to send out to your families. Either way, um, there are four, um, four stations or four domains, geometry, operations, and algebraic thinking, numbers and operations, and base 10, and measurement and data. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to highlight one of the grade banded activities um, and kind of show you what's in it. Um, so, for example, um, in geometry, there is a grade five battleship game. Um, and so not only do you have that game and it tells you the purpose and the materials and how it's aligned to the standards, the content standards and standards for mathematical practices. Um, but what's also nice is that um, it gives you family prompts. And so the instructions are there and then the questions to ask your kiddos when you're playing, like how did you choose your coordinates? Um, when you plotted your points, how did you use the X and Y axis? And I think Maggie actually led this station at one of the face-to-face -face, um, Kentucky Family Math Nights. So Mags, do you wanna, wanna hop in and tell about your experience? Well, um, and we'll talk about this later, but Kentucky Family Math Nights are a great way to um, really lean on and learn from your mathematics community because I had a great room full of teachers and when I got overwhelmed with how many kids were coming to play, we they stepped in, we did another table and it worked out really well. Um, one piece of advice that I would give to teachers who are trying to reimagine perhaps how they might make this occur virtually is that probably just providing our parents and families and caregivers with that facilitators guide page 
Um, they might need that, yes, because it's important for them to have that background knowledge, which Carrie will talk about in just a second. But you may have to kind of scaffold and support that for um, those families and, and caregivers who might not feel as confident in the mathematics content because the facilitator's guide was really written for in its original form, written for teachers who were going to facilitate this um, at those in-person experiences. But one of the great things about virtual learning um, is that while it has its downfalls and we are all learning and <laughs> trying to find ways to overcome obstacles, it also gives us a great way to be innovative. And so, as Erin mentioned, maybe take a minute and and record a five minute video, you know, demonstrating to parents maybe how to play Battleship or give them some of that background knowledge that can support them as they make this happen. If you have um, kids at home and can play with them or if you can set up with another teacher, um, if you have a well behaved pet, which will <laughs> sit in front of a coordinate grid, I mean, work with what you have. Um, for example, if I were doing Battleship and we're working to support parents and families, I would probably want to either um, record a video to show them how to set the game up or at minimum provide them with the, pic the image on the screen of what does that first quadrant look like when you scale it from one to ten. Um, and so just keep that in mind as you consider ways to make these experiences um, digital. And um, we're excited to hear about ways that you're innovative. Perfect, Maggie, and thank you um, for talking about it's just that first quadrant, especially um, that's what fifth grade standards um, allow for the kiddos to dive into. You could if you have older kiddos in sixth or eighth grade and you want to expose them to the other three quadrants, that's great, but fifth grade stays in that first quadrant. All right. And so our next um, station that we want to highlight um, or activity, it's a K-1. Um, now also remember in operations and algebraic thinking, there are activities for grades two, three, and four, five, but this one is called the flip the cards game. And um, again, facilitators notes to give you kind of the background of the mathematics and how it's aligned to the standards. And then as well as it's going to give family prompts, so questions you can ask your kiddos as you're playing and um, directions on how to play the game. And so um, you get these cards. They have, um, which is nice because you can actually can see the quantities and then the actual um, number, the representation. And so you can flip them over and try to match them up. You could um, have them, your kiddos sequence them. You could play um, where you race, you know, and add sums and whoever has the largest sum wins that, um, wins that pair of cards. So lots of different ways that you can interact with the flip the cards game. Station three, numbers and operations in base 10. Um, this, we um, wanted to highlight this grade four and five multiplication card game. So if you just have a regular deck of cards at home, that's great. Um, this really focuses on fluency. And so um, the definition of fluency is probably a little bit different than what you've maybe heard before. Um, I think for so many years, um, there has been a focus on um, accuracy <laughs> and um, for it to be correct and for it to be very quickly. And so that's not um, what research says to do. What research says is that we have to be efficient with solving our um, math facts. We have to be accurate. We have to be flexible and we have to use them appropriately. So, for example, if I flip over the card um, six and I flip over uh, five, so six times five is 30, but maybe I didn't, um, maybe I'm as a kiddo, I'm struggling with that. And so maybe I needed to go back and anchor to my fives. Well, I know that five times five is 25. And so I just needed to add one more group of six. Um, so maybe that's a strategy. And so I think you have the opportunity if, if this is led virtually to share some of those strategies um, or maybe it's I need to draw six groups of five um, and work with that with my kids. So 
it's really um, more emphasis on the flexibility and the appropriate strategy and not so much on the um, we don't want to kill and drill uh, those skills. And so let's look at our last station. Um, this was one of the stations that I actually got to work with um, some kiddos in the family math night and um, just be ready to get your hands dirty. Um, lots of fun, but um, they are making Play-Doh. So there's um, a station for kid for students in K-1 and or K-2, sorry, and then also um, a Play-Doh station for um, students in grades three through five. And so the difference is, is that um, the students that are making the Play-Doh in K-2 they're working with whole numbers and then the kids that are um, making play-doh in grades three through five they're measuring things in fractions and so if you have students at home that are ranging different grade levels just like i do um then have them don't let them cheat don't let them go and get the whole cup measuring you know let them think that okay if i need a half of a half that's a fourth, so I'm going to use a fourth of a cup. Um, just let them let them experience those um, fractions as they are um, making Play-Doh and as you're cooking. So that's um, just something that you can do at home. All right, and then Carrie, go ahead. All right, so to implement your math nights, you're going to need to closely review that facilitator guide that Aaron went over. And then you'll want to work with a team of teachers and school staff to actually um, be able to implement the math nights. Uh, so we're going to offer some considerations for collaborating with your colleagues to implement these family math nights. So we know more and more teachers are taking leadership roles in their school, and we're starting to better understand how to increase engagement in teacher led learning sessions. So this slide's gonna offer a few approaches that appear to increase engagement as shared by some teachers who participated in teacher-led professional development. So first, if you're sharing these activities and you wanna train other teachers on how to do them, consider ways to increase their engagement. Um, the first thing you can do is think about a time you participated in a learning session facilitated by a colleague. So what worked for you? What strategies helped you engage in the session? Um, how might your engagement been increased? And is the strategy that your colleague used one that you would that would translate well if you're training other teachers in an online experience? So think about um, what worked for you as a learner to inform how you share this with others. Then um, you can identify some other strategies, um, including uh, explaining the strategies or the activities briefly but then also giving participants a chance to practice or observe. So get really hands on with the activities, um, encouraging other teachers to work through the activities in, with partners or in small groups so they can work together. Building from their existing work. So what are they doing in the classroom that's related that might help them better understand the activity? And then um, also this is an opportunity to connect and grow with your colleagues. So you wanna make sure you're presenting yourself also as a learner and learning from them. And then using humor as you can to make them feel at ease and also to have fun with the activities. So if um, you are hosting your Kentucky Family Math Night, there are also some considerations for you um, in working with your colleagues. So identify one or more teachers for each math station. So if you're doing this in person, you'll want to have at least one facilitator per station, preferably with a mix of primary and upper elementary school representation since the activities do, script, do uh, go from K to five. Then you'll want to ensure that each math station lead has time to practice their activities, but also to consider questions that families might have. So they'll want to practice and be almost an expert in the activity and also think through what are some of the, the points where parents or students might have questions and how to anticipate those. You wanna make sure each math station lead understands the alignment between the activity and the Kentucky academic standards for math, and that way they can answer questions about it and also make connections to their classroom. 
And then finally, you'll want to make sure to remind them to have fun while engaging with families. That's one of the goals for doing these activities. All right, so now let's discuss how to develop a plan for your math night. Um, there are a few key considerations in planning for your math night. So if you are hosting an in-person math night, we recommend you start at least six weeks in advance and work backwards. This will allow enough time for you to plan the event and engage your stakeholders. Um, if you are doing it virtually, you may be able to condense this timeline because there's a little bit more flexibility in scheduling um, and you may be able to break the activities up and not do them all at once. So again, for location, if you're in person, um, your school gym or cafeteria might work really well. Um, you could also consider a local community center or a library if it's more central. Uh, make sure you have enough room to do all the stations, to have people moving around. We know, you know, these math nights can attract a lot of people, so you want to make sure to have lots of space. Um, if you're doing them virtually, consider what platform you might use. Um, is there a platform such as Zoom that has um, camp, webcam capabilities where you can be um, engaging face to face with families um, or are there uh, needs to have breakout rooms for smaller groups virtually. So make sure you consider those types of things when you're picking your platform. Um, you'll also want to form your team. So make sure that you have um, the teachers and the facilitators you need to do all the activities. Um, and you can also look for volunteers outside of your school. Um, so people who might help you if it's in person, serve dinner, prepare for the event, clean up. Um, if virtual, you might want to look for someone who's really tech savvy. If you have a tech specialist at your school or just someone who can help with some of those more um, logistical tech things. And then finally, um, you'll want to consider who are the key stakeholders in your math night. Um, so thinking about including some parents and planning to just help um, make sure that you're targeting the event. Wow. So we've developed an action planning template um, for you to use to plan your math night. And um, as you're completing the template, you'll want to consider, do you need to adjust anything in the timeline to accommodate your school context? Um, are there any school staff or potential volunteers that can help you with planning some of these things? And are there any additional tasks you need to include to plan a successful event? So if you're like me, you are hearing these and even though we are constantly learning about technology, um, just, you know, that happens to everybody. And so we want you to be excited about new ideas, but we also want you, as Carrie mentioned about considerations, you know, be, be a learner, you know, embrace this knowing that, you know, if you try something once and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean, you know, scrap the whole thing. It just might mean, you know, go back, replan, go back and work with your team. Um, I get new ideas every time um, I hear this and note technology is hard sometimes. This is not our first recording. And so sometimes that will happen and um, we understand that it will happen if you are trying to host these digitally, but just be patient with yourself. And as Carrie mentioned, have see if there's somebody who can help you with tech or consider working with your teams of teachers. So a couple of things as we condense those ideas down to four bullets, just some things to think about. Host activities may be at multiple times um, and different days or times so that parents who are um, balancing you know, different things that are happening in the home or caregivers who are operating on a different schedule so that maybe they can find a time or a day that they can participate even if they can't participate in the whole thing. Um, consider sending activities out of short daily experiences rather than hosting one um, virtual event in an hour or two hour block. You know, that might fit better with people's schedules just depending on what you have going on in your school and in your community. So um, identify a primary method and platform and Carrie mentioned this as well and how you're going to work with parents and share this with them and coordinate with your local school district to ensure consistency and communication methods. This would be a great opportunity to um, collaborate with other elementary schools in your district and team up to offer these experiences. So um, maybe you could host them at different times and that would offer more students in your whole community. 
um, the opportunity to engage or you can just bounce ideas off of each other and that having that in the planning part is going to be really valuable. Um, we know that these are all our kids, so if you can collaborate with other teachers in your community um, and serve more parents and families and students, then all the better. And then also just don't forget in your planning and considerations to think about those non English speaking families who may need translated information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the standards family guides are available in Spanish, but as you're thinking about how you might use this information to serve um, families in your community, just um, consider some of these things in the planning and most of all make it work for you. So if you can host in person and we are at a day and time when you are able to do that and make that happen, great. Until then, if you're going to use these act activities, be flexible. We want you to use them in the way that works best for you and the way that works best for your family and your community. Very well said. OK, so five things to know before you go. Um, just remember that engaging in early mathematics achievement is associated with later on success in life. And that family and teacher feedback is really important for math learning. So changing your mindset and the way you provide feedback can help your children succeed in math. And remember to utilize those Kentucky Family Standards Guides. Those were developed by teachers and are intended to serve as tools that can open the door for conversations around a student's success. And we all need to be having those conversations right now. And the family math not activities and games, they help create a shared understanding of math concepts um, and math knowledge um, for your families. And so just work with your colleagues to see how you can use those resources in the Kentucky Family Math Night Facilitators Guide. And remember at Family Math Nights, educators, children, and family members can learn and talk about mathematics while participating in activities that are aligned to those important Kentucky academic standards for mathematics. So as you think about how you can use the facilitator's guide and use that PowerPoint and begin thinking about how you can serve communities um, around the state and serve their families and students, we would love to hear back from you. So if you have hosted an in-person Kentucky Family Math Night, we would love for you to share the survey link with parents and that's just going to give us a little feedback. Um, we are excited about this document and we want it to be as powerful as possible. And so any feedback would help us make that happen around our state. If you are able to use this resource virtually and you try some of those activities and you um, share about growth mindset or you share the family guides or you and your child or children or pets are digging in and making Play-Doh at home, we want to know about it. Tell us how it went. Um, and share those ideas that you have because we would love to hear them. OK, thank you all so much. Um, we really appreciate our sponsors, Kentucky Center for Mathematics and the Pritchard Committee and RAIL. And then um, just Carrie and Maggie, thank you all so much um, for just being great partners and collaborators in this work. OK, have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right.